Hi everybody, in this video tutorial, we're gonna talk about spinal cord processing. That is the pathways that sensory signals will take to go from the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system, and motor signals and the pathways they take to leave the central nervous system to go back to the peripheral nervous system. The focus will be on monosynaptic reflexes, polysynaptic reflexes, autonomic reflexes, with a finishing of the pathway of signals going from the eyeball to the brain, down the spinal cord, and out to a skeletal muscle for a voluntary contraction. Now you can see that I already have several structures labeled here, and I've got a color coding on the right side showing what neurons we'll be focusing on for these pathways. The other thing that I want to kind of draw your attention to first here will be the two diagrams I have of the spinal cord. The first one will show the extensions coming off the spinal cord in which we will focus on signals going to the spinal cord and then leaving the spinal cord. The other diagram we have here is the large zoomed in version of a cross section of the lumbar spinal cord, showing again those structures coming off the spinal cord. Now this image is going to be the primary one that we are going to use to diagram the pathways of signals. So let's start with that. Let's start by labeling the structures coming off the spinal cord. Now on the dorsal and ventral side, you will have rootlets. Dorsal and ventral side, you will have roots. The dorsal root is identifiable by that enlarged bulge, which is called the dorsal root ganglion and houses the cell bodies of sensory neurons. Where the roots come together and join is called the spinal nerve of which there are 31. And spinal nerves aren't very long because shortly after they form, they split again three ways into rami, of which there is a dorsal ramus, there is a ventral ramus, and then in the middle here, you have a meningeal ramus. We're not gonna talk about the meningeal rami because they serve the meninges and intervertebral discs. We're not gonna talk about the, the dorsal rami because they're going to innervate narrow strips of skeletal muscle and skin along the thoracic and abdominal regions. Our main focus will be on the ventral rami. The ventral rami being the most important to talk about because these will give rise to the various plexuses of the body which will then split off into all the nerves, innervating the skin, internal organs, and skeletal muscle and glands. So there we have the structures. So let's jump right in here and start talking about the first pathway, the monosynaptic reflex pathway. The monosynaptic reflex pathway is so named because there's a single synapse between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. The most common monosynaptic reflexes out there will be the patellar reflex, and the Achilles reflex. So we're going to focus on the patellar reflex because we're looking at a cross-section of the lumbar vertebrae and the lumbar spinal cord. So the first thing we'll have here will be a hammer tap on the patellar tendon within the knee. Sensory information will sense will extend up into the ventral rami, spinal nerve, dorsal root, there's a dorsal root ganglion with the cell body. Rootlets, gray matter. Now gray matter, that's going to be where integration occurs. So here, because it is a monosynaptic reflex, the only integration that is occurring will be the transferring of signals from sensory neuron, somatic sensory, dealing with skeletal muscle, to somatic motor neuron, which is going to go out the ventral rootlets ventral root, spinal nerve, right back out to the quadriceps muscle, which will allow your leg to extend, your knee to kick out. So this is why it's called a monosynaptic reflex, a single synapse between sensory and motor neuron. So now let's look at a polysynaptic reflex and compare. Polysynaptic reflexes are called somatic withdrawal reflexes, as well when they deal with skeletal muscle. And they're gonna involve a middleman, an interneuron. So therefore, there are really two synapses here. 
a synapse between sensory and interneuron, and a synapse between motor and interneuron. The most common withdrawal reflex examples are when you touch something hot and you pull your hand back. You step on something sharp, you pull your foot back. Or you pull your hand back when a dog might try to bite you. So we'll draw this out. And what you'll hopefully see is that for the most part, the pathways are much the same. So we'll draw a sensory neuron. So let's say you step on something sharp. Sensory signals will ascend into the ventral ramus, spinal nerve, dorsal root. There's your cell body in the dorsal root ganglion, dorsal rootlets. And then here, this is where it's going to be a little bit different in that the sensory neuron will synapse with an interneuron, giving it a little bit more integration, a little bit more interpretation because it is an, indeed a more complicated reflex, involves the contraction of multiple skeletal muscles. But it will transfer signals to a motor neuron, which will then go out the same pathway down to the muscles of the lower leg and upper leg so you can contract those muscles and pull your foot off that sharp object. So here you have your polysynaptic somatic reflex. And just compare that with the monosynaptic. The really only big difference here is the fact that there is an interneuron involved for more interpretation, more integration of that reflex. The other thing to make note between these two reflexes is that no signals are going up to the brain for this response to happen. Now this does not mean that signals do not go up to the brain for a reflex. Indeed, signals do. So at the time that this reflex is occurring, or really pretty much shortly after the reflex had already happened and you had hopefully pulled back from that stimulus and gotten a response, signals, interneurons, which had synapse with that sensory neuron, Interneurons are going to send signals up to the brain. And this is going to be where it will go to the thalamus, which will then get distributed to the various functional areas of the brain. This way, you will become consciously aware of what just happened regarding the reflex. You will then be able to make decisions, analyze the situation. You will store memories about that situation. You will learn from that situation. You will create emotions to that situation, you will be aware of overall what just happened and then decide what steps you need to take after that reflex had happened. So signals do indeed go up to the brain after the reflex, but the reflex happens first because you need to fix that problem, get rid of that stimulus as fast as possible, especially if it is potentially life-threatening. So there you have the somatic reflexes, monosynaptic and polysynaptic Somatic reflex is dealing with skeletal muscle. Now, what about an autonomic reflex? Autonomic reflexes deal with glands, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. So I'll draw one of those out. And since we're in the lumbar region, let's focus on the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder, like all the other internal organs, will have sensory receptors to monitor various things, such as pH and pressure. So for the urinary bladder, let's focus on pressure. The urinary bladder swells up, and those sensory receptors detect building of pressure, which will ultimately lead you to go urinate. So sensory information will come up the nerves, ventral ramus, spinal nerve, dorsal root, the dorsal root ganglion, just like a normal sensory, somatic sensory neuron would, dorsal rootlets, and it will go into the gray matter. And then what's going to come after that will be a synapse between a visceral motor neuron, which will transmit motor information back out. And in this case, the motor information will be to contract the smooth muscle. Motor information will go back out and head towards the urinary bladder. Now this is gonna be where it's different than the other reflexes. Visceral reflexes are 
the majority will be polysynaptic. Now, it's not polysynaptic because you have an interneuron involved. It is polysynaptic because you have two motor neurons. You have a preganglionic neuron, the one orange neuron I've already drawn, and there will be a postganglionic neuron, the second motor neuron, that will go to the urinary bladder for smooth muscle contraction for the effect. Now, the reason why they're called preganglionic and postganglionic neurons are because in the peripheral nervous system, there are bubbles as well, the ganglion, that will house the synapses where these two neurons meet. So here we have the three reflexes, a monosynaptic somatic reflex, a polysynaptic somatic reflex, and a polysynaptic autonomic or visceral reflex. Be able to compare these, and you can really see the comparisons will primarily be are interneurons involved and how many motor neurons are involved. But regardless, they're all reflexes. They all do not require input from the brain to occur. But signals are indeed sent up to the brain so that way you are consciously aware of what the reflex is, what just happened, and you can make the appropriate decisions and learn from those, those reflexes. So what we're going to finish off with here will be what it would look like to have a stimulation of the photoreceptors in the eyeball and the pathways that it will take to go into the brain and then out the central nervous system to get a voluntary contraction of skeletal muscle to pick up the object that you saw. So the first thing that would happen would be light would enter the eyeball and stimulate the photoreceptors of the retina. These, these cells okay, will create action potentials and transmit signals along neurons, sensory neurons, within the optic nerve. And then they will synapse at the thalamus with interneurons. And then this is going to be where here the interneurons, the thalamus being the gateway, the distribution center, will transmit signals to the appropriate functional area. So in this case, it would be here to the primary visual cortex, making your brain aware of something you saw. Signals will then go to the visual association area, which will allow your brain to be aware of what it is you specifically saw. So let's say in this case, it is going to be a coffee cup. And at that time, signals will go to the other functional areas for a more complete picture. Common integrative area, allowing you to recognize that it is your mug. The prefrontal cortex, which will then allow you to give more information into that, that stimulus, such as you remembering you made coffee, you remember that the coffee is hot, it'll bring in other memories as well. So then, if you're going to create a motor response, and in this case we will, to pick up that coffee mug, Information signals need to travel along these interneurons to their primary motor cortex, premotor cortex, and then signals will end up being transmitted down the spinal cord where it will synapse in the gray matter with a somatic motor neuron. And the somatic motor neuron will then transmit signals out the ventral rootlets, out the ventral root, spinal nerve, the ventral ramus, and out to skeletal muscle for contraction and allowing you to contract your muscles to grab the coffee cup and pick up the coffee cup. Now notice how here we didn't really talk about with this process, this pathway, the dorsal rootlets, dorsal root. And that is because for this, the sensory information originated within the eyeball. Now, if the sensory information originated within the hand, where the skeletal muscles are located to pick up the coffee cup, then you would involve the dorsal root and dorsal rootlets. So in summary, in this video, we walk through the major pathways focusing on the monosynaptic reflex, polysynaptic reflex for skeletal muscle, polysynaptic reflex for autonomic response, or visceral response, and the pathway 
that signals would take to go from a special sense organ to the brain, down the spinal cord, and out the spinal cord for a motor response.